So the initial plan was to get back to the Tetons Pass where the sky forecast was excellent and try and get the Seaford variables in Andromeda. The no sooner had I got there I pointed the scope at Jupiter just to see what was going on. Well, the seeing was much better than the previous night at Yellowstone and there was a, a moon just about to start a transit so I thought, right, well I'm going to stick with this. Now, the time lapses of Jupiter are a pain to do in that what I do is I take about 15 seconds of video every 3 minutes and I use about 10 seconds of that in a program called Registax to get the statistics for a lucky frame which is essentially it essentially performs the same sort of task as inefficient adaptive optics and what that practically does is it enables the scope to realize fairly near to its true re its absolute resolution limit and that's maybe a factor of 10 or 100 better than you could get off a simple single frame exposure now processing the data takes a long time for one of these these time lapses, maybe five hours. So I didn't actually do it at the time, I did that a couple of days later. And when I did, it was a hell of an eyebrow razor, in that it actually looks like something hits IO. Now IO is a couple of thousand kilometers in diameter and the video was shot over maybe two and a half hours. That means that these plumes are maybe 4,000 kilometers, if they're real. Now, that's much further than you get off a volcanic plume of something as small as Io. So, if it were an impact, it would be traveling, whatever, 4,000 kilometers in two and a half hours. That's about 10,000 kilometers per hour. Now, that is commensurate with impact velocities, but you've got to be realistic here. The chances of seeing an impact on Jupiter are almost zero. Having said that, you can still see the impact scar from the comet that hit it a couple of weeks ago. That's just above the Great Red Spot. Having said that, the chances of getting an impact on Io while it's transiting are laughable. Now, there are more realistic alternatives in that it's probably an optical effect enhanced by the processing. Now, it should be noticed that the funny shaped spot is actually visible in the original data, and I noted at the time that it seemed it looked like a double transit. Like you see here, just about there, there's like two little black dots. So, I mean, it wasn't a double transit, I know that because I've, I've since looked up the position of the moons. But that's what initially I thought was going on when I was looking at the raw, uh, looking at the image that I was getting out of the telescope. Now the scope had been freshly collimated, but temperature does change over the night, and that might have had an effect, especially when you're blowing up an image as much as this one. Similarly, this is actually a much more cluttered train, optical train than most setups, in that there's a scope an eyepiece, an HD camera, all in the optical train. And the only bits that I can easily collimate is the actual scope itself. Now, this is the problem with all these technological endeavours, is the more sophisticated they get, the more subtle the problems you have to be aware of. And this was only my fourth attempt at this sort of thing, so... However, if at some later point someone does point a scope at IO and finds a big ass crater on it then all of this video then becomes really very valuable but I mean let's be realistic it, it's almost certainly not what happened anyway I didn't know any of this at the time I didn't know any of this till a couple of days later so after the transit had finished it was getting fairly late so having worked out some of the earlier teething troubles uh, taking deep sky pictures I thought well I'll have a more determined go and first target was the Horsehead Nebula which I spent maybe 40 minutes on and yeah you don't get long between when the um, Horsehead Nebula rises at this time of year and when it goes into astronomical twilight and you can't do anything else the way you do it is you do 30 second exposures to avoid field rotation and then you stack them up later. So I took maybe 20 pictures, 20 dark frames and let a program called Deep Sky Stacker take care of the rest. And that produced, I thought, fairly impressive results for only my second real go on the horse head. 
Anyway, after that, I re-hit the Crab Nebula for 10 minutes, and similarly, M81 and M82, which are a couple of galaxies and Big Dipper. The one on the uh, left being an active galaxy, that is, it's uh, an extremely bright X-ray source. So anyway, that was the second night of astronomy on the uh, Tetons Pass.